Welcome to Dare to Soar with your host, Dr. R.C. Dr. R.C. will empower, encourage, and strengthen you. She will help you to soar to your highest potential hope. Please welcome the host of Dare to Soar, Dr. C. Good morning and welcome. I am so excited to have this conversation this morning because it is one that is so, so very critical. I am Dr. R.C., your host, and yes, this is Dare to Soar, coming to you live from the BBM Global Network and Tune In Radio. This morning, I have members with me um, that I'll be speaking with from the National Association of Black Social Workers. And what are we going to be talking about? Voting is a social work practice. Now, with that being said, I want to get right in. And first, I'd like my guests to introduce themselves, if they would share their names, where they obtained their MSW degree from, their current work environment, and just what drew them to the field of social work. So I want to start with Dr. Crocker Billingsley. Would you please, and welcome to the show. Good morning. I pray that you um, well. I am Dr. Judith D. Crocker Billingsley. Many of my students uh, and colleagues refer to me as Dr. J. To give you a, a little bit of information about me, I am a Georgia native, was born and raised in Columbus, Georgia near Fort Benning. I obtained a human service degree from Spelman College in Atlanta, Georgia, next door and got a uh, an MSW, um, from uh, what is it, Clark Atlanta University, planning and, and social science, also from the Whitney M. Young Jr. School of Social Work. My research is related to policy work. I wanted to be an agent of change, so I will pass the uh, baton to my fellow colleagues. Thank you for that beautiful introduction. So we're going to go to our gentleman next. Um, as and responding to those same questions. Thank you for the invitation, and I'm I'm proudly serving as co-chair with the two other uh, co-chairs that on this panel today. Uh, I'm Dr. Onaji Maweed. Uh, I did my master's degree at uh, Stony Brook University in New York New York State, uh, actually um, Long Island and my doctorate at the University of Southern California. And what drove me to social work was just a natural inclination to liberate my people, to be a part of what is called the liberation process. The National Association of Black Social Workers, we have a code of ethics that says in America today, no black person except the selfish or the irrational can claim neutrality in the quest for black liberation, nor fail to consider the implications of the events taking place in our society today. So that even though that statement was written in 1968, it's so relevant right here today as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much. And last but not at all least, my third guest, please introduce yourself. Hello, everyone. My name is Tiffany Lee Thornhill. Uh, I first want to apologize that I'm driving. Uh, as you know, social workers do, we're always busy, even on the weekends, doing events and making sure that folks are getting what they need. So that's what I'm heading to. I'm also here um, in the state of Arizona, so it's really early for me. Um, <laughs> anyhow, uh, I received all of my social work degrees. I have a bachelor's in social work and a master's in social work, also a master's in public administration from Arizona State University here in the state of Arizona. I also currently work at Arizona State University as a program manager in a center for politics and public service. I also am a faculty associate in the School of Social Work at Arizona State University. Um, also the president of the Association of Black Social Workers chapter here in Arizona as well. Um, what drew me to social work is, uh, social work is my second career. Um, I had a life that was very challenging and I experienced social workers in that life of challenge and I didn't feel like I got the best uh, social worker <laughs> when I was faced with needing one. So uh, I told myself that I was going to be the social worker that I needed and never had. Um, and so that is what I have been doing and working on and working towards. Um, I have a passion for clinical practice, but I also understand and right now in the world that we live in, policy, voting, administration, public administration is where the fire is at. Uh, and to me, that is direct practice at this time. 
So thank you so much for the uh, invitation and the opportunity to speak today. Thank you all so, so very much. Um, Listeners, before we get started, let me give you this call in number, which is 1 866 451 1451. Now, as I stated, this conversation is going to be um, something that of eye opening, and I'm sure about that, as well as giving you so much, providing with so much um, needed information. And then it's going to give you food for thought also. Now, with that being shared, uh, Dr. Crocker Billingsley, I'd like to ask you this first question. Can you explain to the Dare to Soar audience why voting is considered a social work practice? Wow, that's one of the most important questions of the hour, uh, Dr. R.C. Why is voting um, considered a social work practice? One of the things I want to start by saying, we have a colleague, many of you know of our colleague. He is the former Congressman Edolphus Ed Towns who served in Congress out of New York. And he pretty much wrote a book. And in this particular book, it is called Affecting Change, Social Workers in the uh, Political Arena. And what Congressman Towns said in this particular book, that we as social work practitioners, we have a viable uh, role and we have a viable uh, impact on policy and how policy is made. It, 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 one of the statements he said was social workers, we cannot afford to sit back and allow others, others, my social work colleagues and listening audience that we are expected to implement. Now, t you know, kind of let that soak in a little bit. Social workers, those who have studied, we have studied and we have implemented the policies and seen the negative effect of these current policies. We also have seen some positive effects of what we're seeing and the deficits in these programs and how uh, the unfulfilled needs of the people uh, ought to be able to initiate a legislative efforts to form new programs or revamp old programs. So social workers, we play a huge role. Vote, voting is a human rights practice. And social workers understand the importance of voters to the political action. Social workers, we understand community power, social justice dating back to the settlement house movement. Voter engagement remains central to all of us social workers. So I just have to say, voting uh, is uh, is very uh, impactful. Social workers, we vote. Social workers, we put together organizations to make sure people do vote. So I'm going to be quiet and and let that soak in for a couple of seconds. Well, thank you so much. And that is definitely, definitely enough to soak in. Boy, that sponge should be filled right now, my dear colleagues, because, hey, Dr. Crockett Billingsley just gave you so much to think about. 1-866-451-1451. I told you this conversation is a much needed one. It's going to be one of empowerment also. That is the goal for my three panelists this morning. They're going to be sharing this information that's going to let you just absorb, as Dr. Crockett Billingsley said, like a sponge, absorb that information. She's letting it sit in. Now, I need to come back to you again, Dr. Crocker Billingsley. So how does voting intersect with social work values and principles? You share that, you know, it is a human right and we know all these things in the work that we do, but can you just kind of tap into it just a little bit more for us? Yes, I don't mind doing that. Well, um, being a social worker, the three of us, you are, are actually listening, uh, my dear audience, to three of the most powerful uh, social workers uh, out there. I'm not being modest. I'm not being arrogant. But we serve on the National Relations Committee uh, for the National Association of Black Social Workers. We are driven we are driven by our code of ethics. So I'm gonna present it to you uh, in two ways. I'm gonna present to you the NABSW social work code of ethics, and then I'm gonna share with you what the NASW code of ethics have to say. The both are similar and we are bounded together at the hip. 
So when we talk about the uh, code of ethics, we're talking about social justice. We're talking about service. Social workers have a need to provide services. We're talking about dignity and the worth of our people. The NABSW uh, code of ethics say, we regard, we take an oath that says, I regard as my primary obligation the welfare of the black individuals to the interest okay the, the the black individual the black family the black community and we engage in action for improving uh social uh conditions okay so and then we talk about the dignity and worth of our people we are concerned about how our people live how our people think how our people are the NABSW code of ethics say we give precedence to the mission over our own personal needs. Okay, we adopt the the black concept of the extended family, and also we're talking about integrity. We're talking about the quality of of our people. So the uh, code of ethics uh, play a very important role among social workers we are obligated to make sure that we carry out these uh, uh code of ethics you, you know we consciously use our skill and our whole be as an instrument i'm talking about social workers for social change we are agents of change and this group we say we are change agents mm -hmm. Wow, that was, oh my goodness. You know, I feel like a PSA, a commercial or something, especially, you know, with voting approaching us so quickly at this time, but I don't want to get too far off the weeds with it. I am speaking with members from the National Association of Black Social Workers. And what are we talking about? I'm so glad because I can see those question marks. We're speaking about voting is a social work practice. So if you know a social worker, or if you had interaction with a social worker, tap into them let them know to join in on this conversation today so i just want to take a moment just to once again thank my guests because hey this conversation is so well needed uh you know the process of how things are changing in societal in society today as dr billingsley said agents of change but they're considered change agents it is time for a commercial break. Don't go away, guys. We have so much more. And when we return, we have Dr. Mue who will be leading the next question. We will be right back. Author, radio show host, and coach John M. Hawkins reveals strategies to help gain perspective, build confidence, find clarity, achieve goals. John M. Hawkins' new book, Coached to Greatness, unlock your full potential with limitless growth. Published by iUniverse, Hawkins reveals strategies to help readers accomplish more. He believes the book can coach them to greatness. Hawkins says that the best athletes get to the top of their sport with the help of coaches, mentors, and others. He shares guidance that helps readers reflect on what motivates them rediscover and assess their core values, philosophies, and competencies, find settings that allow them to be the most productive, and track their progress towards accomplishing goals. Listen to John Hawkins' My Strategy, Saturdays, 1 p.m. Eastern, on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. What if there were a super tiny device that could diagnose the brain and is smaller than a single human hair? What if you could see inside the brain to help an epilepsy patient during surgery or to help the fight against Parkinson's disease? Dr. Patricia Broderick is proud to announce the Broderick Probe, a biomedical and electronic probe. Imagine a probe to help with the understanding and potential cure of brain-related diseases. To learn more, listen live to the Easy Sense Radio Show with host Dr. Broderick, Wednesdays, 7 p.m. Eastern, on the Bold Brave Media Network and TuneIn Radio. And to help support the Broderick Foundation, please go to easysense.com and learn how, with your help, we can fight these horrific brain disorders. That's EasySense.com to learn more and help support the Broderick Foundation. 
Welcome back once again, everyone. I am so excited to have this conversation on this Saturday. I am Dr. RC, your host, and of course, this is Dare to Soar coming to you live from the BBM Global Network and Tune In Radio. I have three very profound panelists with me today from the National Association of Black Social Workers. And guess what? We are talking about voting is a social work practice. So with that being said, before Dr. Moed Moweed gets back into our line of questioning, that call-in number is 1-866-451-1451. Now, please share, what role can social workers play in encouraging voter participation within their communities? So I think that's directed towards me. Yes, it is. Yes, it okay. is. Th thank you for the question. Just to the listening audience, I'd just like to share with you a, a framework. Uh, social workers are involved in the quest of empowerment. We don't empower our clients. We help them and create the environment for them to empower themselves. On a micro or individual level, which we say micro, uh, on a family level, which sometimes we refer to meso, but also on a group level, which we usually refer to as mac mac macro. So this question of empowerment has to be evident in all three levels for it to be uh, truly uh, fully realized. Uh, I'm gonna go back for a minute. I'm gonna go back to 1964. This is what this is what El Haj Monique Malcolm X says. He says, in 1964 threatens to be the most explosive year America has ever witnessed. The most, excuse me, the most um, explosive year. Why? Because it's the political year it's a year when all the white politicians will be back in our so-called Negro community, jiving you and me for some votes. The year when all white political crooks will be right back in our community. So we're looking at a question of not only voting as far as electoral votes, we're looking really at the question of self-determination. How do a people who are captive inside of a nation state exercise their political autonomy and so at first it starts with electoral votes but it's not that's just a means to an end the end is for people to liberate themselves so we feel that voting is um important because it starts to get raise people's consciousness in the quest for our black liberation and it also starts to organize people most most of the things that we are confronted by is really a lack of organization and that's why getting people involved in voting is very important so again how do we help assist in the process of empowerment on the micro level on the meso level and the macro level thank you thank you so much for that response and it is so thought-provoking um the way you lined it up and giving that response listeners i'm telling you you know, I always tell you, do you have those ink pens ready or that pencil, whichever your comfort level is with taking notes? This is a conversation that you definitely want to take notes on. That call in number again is 1-866-451-1451. I want to continue with my questions because I definitely want to get to everyone that I have for my panelists on this morning. So Dr. Crocker Billingsley, I'm coming back to you again. And with that being said, <laughs> are there any specific barriers that black individuals face in exercising their right to vote and how can social workers address these barriers? Wow. Um, thank you for that question. Now, when we talk about critical thinking, you just threw that at me. So uh, I'm gonna put on my critical thought pattern. Um, many of you know, don't know, I am a professor at Johnson C. Smith University in Charlotte, North Carolina, but my home base is Atlanta, Georgia. You heard me talk about, um, I gave you a little bit of background on my educational uh, trajectory or whatever. I am a member of Ebenezer Baptist Church, where Senator Raphael uh, Warnock is my pastor. Some of the barriers, I think about the election uh, what, two and a half years ago, uh, Dr. Mowat and, and um, uh, my colleague, Ms. Thorne here. I remember when we were in line, okay, trying to vote, 
we stayed in line for about five or six hours, okay, to vote. I, my spelling sister, Stacey Abrams, was, was running for something, um, but it was a huge uh, presidential election, government election or whatever. Um, it was at that particular time where, you know, Blacks showed up in numbers, Dr. R.C., you might remember this as well. Shortly after that, because Blacks showed up in numbers to make a decision, they showed up because they wanted to elect people to improve their well-being. Shortly after that, a law was passed in Georgia saying, you can't bring us no water to drink. You can't bring us no food to drink. You know, you can't even um, sit and talk to us while we're in line, so to speak. So there are barriers in place to keep us from voting. As you heard my former colleague just talk about, you know, the micro, the, the, uh, the mezzo and the macro. Okay. So um, us standing in line helped to influence the governmental decisions like we are determined. There are barriers in place. You know, think about uh, the people who do the mail-in ballot. They have begun to, they removed the boxes, I think, in Georgia and in other states. So um, I want to hear, let my colleagues chime in a little bit on that one as well, too, because there are barriers to keep Blacks and other impoverished communities from voting. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, would either of my other panelists or my panelists that are present like to chime in on this question? Hi, this is Tiffany over here. I do wanna add something um, to that. I think that one of the biggest barriers that we face as black folks when it comes to voting or even exercising the right to vote is for one, we what's the point right that's what i hear a lot is why why am i voting what's the point why am i doing this um you know the electoral college is going to vote the president in anyways so you know why am i doing this and a lot of our people who have been victimized by the criminal justice system mm -hmm. and so they may not think that they can vote or because they been convicted of a felony they think that you know now my civil rights are gone and i have no say in this process and you know what we saw in the last election was a lot of states gave back rights and access to voting for folks who had felonies um they did it quietly and um you know not a lot of our people know that you know if you have one felony there are so stored so I think it's, you know, these quiet things that kind of get passed behind the scenes, but don't get shared with us on the, and the fact that our local elections matter more than who we vote in as president anyways. Mm -hmm. And so we focus so much on the president and the vice president and all of these national offices without understanding that your local election is where it matters for you. You are voting in your senators, your House of Representatives, your judges, right? We're so, we, we, we vote in our judges on the local level and those local judges are the ones that become those Supreme Court justices after you know they've been there for a while. And so that to me is a barrier. We don't know exactly how powerful our vote is on the local level. And as social workers, you know, according to the NASW, we're here to challenge social injustice. Well, that's an injustice to know that you have that much uh, opportunity to impact what's happening in your state, in your city, in your county, in your town. Um, we need to be sharing that message. So it's yes, it's important for us to participate in national elections. But what's more important to us, specifically as Black folks, is to pay attention on the local level and to pay attention to those judges as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Dr. Moe, would you like to add anything additional to that question? Okay. Uh, not at this time. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. I am uh, Dr. I mean, excuse me, Miss Lee Thornhill. I'm so happy that you and I appreciate that you kind of tearing that down. Uh, and I didn't say tearing it down, listeners. I said tearing it down because it is um, it is so, so critical that that is identified because we get caught up in the higher level until we really forget about what is the building foundation of all of that as well. So I so thank you. Thank you so much for doing that. I understand that we have a student that's trying to call in. So I'll ask my engineer, he can check to, to assist the student with calling in. In the interim, uh, Ms. Lee Thornhill, I'd like to direct this next question to you by asking you to share any examples or uh, initiatives where social workers has successfully, you know, promoted voting engagement and advocacy. My apologies, but um, I would like to defer this question to Dr. Crocker Billingsley, as she has uh, extensive work with those who have created the Congressional Social Work Caucus. Uh, those are her friends. She goes out to dinner with them. Um, so I would, <laughs> I would like to defer the question to her if possible. You most certainly can, Dr. Crocker Billingsley. You. Okay. Let me ask it, ask you, Dr. R.C., to please ask that question again, so uh, so I can have it right. And and again, go to that CT. We call it critical thinking. <laughs> I certainly will. But I noticed that right before that, uh, Dr. Crocker Billingsley, our uh, guest is on the line. So I definitely want to provide an opportunity for that guest to have you know, a, a bit of a space or a floor. So please, guests, identify yourself and let us know where you're calling from. Caller, can you hear me? Okay, so we will circle back around to our caller. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Crocker Billingsley is going to respond to this question, which is, can you share any examples or initiatives where social workers have successfully promoted voter engagement and advocacy? <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, okay, where will we start? You heard me say that, um, you heard me talk about that I did my uh, dissertation at the Whitney M. Young Jr. Mm -hmm. uh, School of Social Work here in Atlanta with Dr. R.C. on the status and objections to the passing of the Dorothy I. Height Whitney M. Young Jr. by the 113th Congress, which has been used as a catalyst on the Hill to actually reinvest and rebrand the profession of social work. So to answer that question, uh, it, in a particular chapter, I think the recommendations is said that we will set up platforms. We will uh, do grassroots work to um, empower social workers to invest in current social workers. You know, we're very um, uh, concerned about those of us who are practicing right now, whether it's in an educational system like the three of us, or if it's, um, you know, grassroots initiatives like the three of us. So what came out of that was I founded with uh, Congressman um, Ed Towns, the Social Work Reinvestment Act, the Social Work uh, Lecture Series Reinvestment Act. And it means that uh, for every institution or every uh, social policy entity that where I am involved in as a social worker, along with other social workers, during March is Social Work Month, we celebrate we celebrate the roles of our social work pioneers, you know, our social work ancestors that Dr. Mouet would probably talk about shortly, and the current social workers who uh, need the support. When we talk about social workers, we had have multiple social workers in Congress to include uh, 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 Karen Bass, to include Barbara Lee, and I'm roll calling some of uh, Ms. Lee's uh, colleagues out there with her in California to in include the doctor, uh, the late Dr. Ron Dellums, and the name goes on and on, to include uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Dorothy I. Height, to include Whitney M. Young Jr. 
Okay, so and it's important that the social work lecture series, you know, it uh, like I say, it celebrates social workers. We uh, initiate platforms no matter where we are mm -hmm. to honor the legacy and the work of our social workers. And I hope, Ms. Lee, that I answered that question um, uh, since you passed that on to me. I mean, even this group, they, we we have begun to, um, this is, will be considered a uh, social work lecture series for the month of April. Um, so we are doing, we are hands-on, we, we are in the trenches. You can find us doing something every month and we only just got started. We are, we call ourselves that agent of change. So uh, give that number back out again, Dr. RC, because if y'all need us, holla at us. We'll come to you too. Outstanding. What a great way to go into that call-in number, which is 1-866-451-1451. I said this conversation was going to be informative, but let me just tell you, platinum nuggets, not golden, but platinum nuggets are being dropped on this morning with the three panelists from the National Association of Black Social Workers. They have introduced themselves. They are providing a wealth of knowledge. I know that those pages are flipping. Once again, 1-866-451-1451. The next question is for Ms. Lee Thornhill, but let me check if our caller is available to ask her question at this time. Okay, maybe she's not quite ready just yet. Maybe she's just listening. So I want to continue on. Ms. Lee Thornhill, this next question is uh, for you. What strategies or approaches can social workers use to educate clients and communities about the importance of voting? Um, yeah, Dr. J, you definitely answered the question very righteously. Thank you for that. Um, for this question, I would say that, you know, like I said earlier in my uh, response to the prior question, we really need to think locally. We need to think locally. We need to uh, focus on the things we can affect locally and the changes that can be made for our clients and our communities on a local level. So as you know, case managers, as clinicians, as direct practice individuals, a lot of our clients are coming in with issues in the schools, right? The children are being, um, you know, they're, they're, they're being, you know, oppressed, they're being adultified, they're, you know, our, our children are just experiencing so many hardships in the schools. Well, we vote board members, yes. right? You're voting for who is making the decisions about what's happening in your school district. And not only are you voting on that, but you have the capacity and the capability to be the person who makes the decisions. Running for a school board seat is so, I, I'm not gonna minimize it, but it's pretty easy uh, to get yourself a school board seat. And, 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 and thinking about that, right? How easy it is to get a school board seat. Well, who's making the decisions for our children in those school board seats who easily got into that seat? So that's, that's one way, uh, you know, we can educate our clients and communities about the importance of voting. Um, also, we are concerned about mass incarceration and the industrial prison complex and, you know, abolition. Well, we vote in our judges. We get to decide who is making those decisions on the criminal justice system in our state. Um, so that's important, right? So, so a lot of what we, you know, we're facing on that micro scale is systematic oppression. The the ramifications of the systematic oppression that has been put in place by these institutions, whether it's the school board, whether it's the judges, whether it's your House of Representatives, whether it's your, you know, your Senate House, they're so um, important. Those decisions, those bills, those uh, things that are being voted on on the local level is what is shaping and governing what's happening in your city, in your state, and in your county. And so it is very, very important to participate in that uh, because it will impact you. It will impact us. It impacts our children. Um, you know, federal minimum wage is a federal thing. However, states get to decide what their minimum wage is. And we as people get to vote on that. So there are so many, many ways um, for us to participate in what is shaping the change for not only our clients, our communities, but also for ourselves and our families as well. So locally, pay attention, pay attention to what's happening on that local level, because that's what's important. 
Thank you. Thank you so much, Miss Lee Thornhill. And you just, oh my gosh, shaping, shaping. That is key, listeners, you know, dare to soar audience. Take that into an consideration and hold on to it because Miss Lee Thornhill just shared with you how everything is laid out. And when you think that your voice doesn't matter, it does. It is critical. It is critical for us to have that for the shift in the changes that we're looking at. We can't just sit on the sidelines and say, oh, I hope that changes. You have to be proactive about it to ensure that happens. And that happens through your vote. It happens through you getting up and going to the polls. I don't want to get too far than weeds. 1-866-451-1451. I understand that we have a student, uh, another student that is trying to call in. Caller, are you on the line with us? Thanks for listening. Hello, caller. Okay, I will come back to the caller. So, Dr. O, I want to come to you at this time. And would you just share how do you see voting as a tool for advancing social justice and equity? Uh, yeah, I want to reference um, Whitney Young Jr. Um, he created what was called a Marshall Plan for the Black community. That means that we need we can we have to understand we can't solve macro problems at a micro level. Macro problems need a macro solution. Reparations is really the quintessential thing that our people need to be focusing on. We under, we must understand what reparations is. We must understand, as has been previously said, that human rights, social work is a human rights profession, which means we have to use human rights principles. When there is an egregious human rights violation, response, there must be a repair. That repair is reparations. So all around the country, different states are now voting for reparations. So so we tied the meso, the micro, the meso, and the macro together. All of them have to work in, in sync. One is not more important than the other. All of them are related because one is going to, in fact, dictate what the other one's going to be. So uh, social justice is our people's ability to recognize that we are living in a nation inside of a nation. What I'm saying to you is that Dr. Martin Luther King told us that we are living in domestic colonies. I didn't say Malcolm X. I said Dr. Martin Luther King. We don't even know what this man represented. He was in Ghana in, in, in 1958 when Ghana became free. King has much more to say and to deliver to us than we can possibly imagine. So social justice is a people realizing not just their civil rights, but in fact, affirming their human rights. And only when we do that, when we begin to understand that our liberation is tied to not just not just the voting in terms of the le le uh, elect elections, but in fact, our our demand for self-determination. Until we, until we become politically mature and affirm that, we will continue to be treated like the second-class citizens that we are. Why do we have to have a voting act that has to get renewed every, what, 12 or 15 years to say that we can vote? Why do we have to? Because we have not, in fact, created the power base that we're going to demand what our needs are. And that's the only thing that's going to get us. It's not voting that's going to give us what we need. It's when, and they demand it. That's the only way that we're going to get what we deserve as a people. Otherwise, we're going to be continually marginalized. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. O, for sharing that information, that critical information. As I said, audience, platinum nuggets are being shared today. They're being dropped. 1-866-451-1451. Uh, my time is running out, but I do have um, another question for Ms. Lee Thornhill, which is, are there any specific policies or issues that social workers should prioritize in their advocacy efforts related to? Excuse me, can I jump in? This is Black Maternity uh, Health One issue, Black Maternity Health Week. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> Absolutely. Ms. Lee Thornhill. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Baba, for that. I was definitely going to talk about the Congressional Black Mothers Caucus that is there on the Hill 
as well. Uh, there's a Black Momnibus Act that they're trying to get passed with regard to Black maternal and child health outcomes. So that is definitely something as social workers we should be paying attention to. And as Black mothers be thinking about whether or not we want to be a part of that caucus as well. There's the Congressional Social Work Caucus that Dr. Angela Henderson, I believe, leads over there on the Hill as well. So that is something we should be paying attention to as social workers also. Um, there's the Freedom to Vote Act that was introduced in the last congressional cycle of the 118th Congress. Um, it, it, does, it didn't seem to go m money places. Uh, <laughs> it wasn't uh, signed into law, but it is something that hopefully we will be reintroducing again, that Freedom to Vote Act. But like, like Dr. Um, o said, you know, why should we have to keep re- um, Resigning this thing, we need something that is institutionalized, that makes it a fundamental human right for all citizens in this democratic country to be able to participate in the democratic process freely, right? So that makes me think about the constitution that still states today that black folks are three fifths of a person. We are still dehumanized in this country. And so if this voting act that has to keep getting re-signed every so odd years reinforces the fact that this country still sees folks as three-fifths of a person. And so we need to be thinking about that as social workers, especially Black social workers, because we are here to fight for the liberation of our people. And policy change is policy change. And if we need to get to the root of the policy, the constitution and change the language that states that black folks are three fifths of a person, well then that might be what us social workers need to focus on because who is the one being treated like animals in this country still to this day? Well, black folks, right? We saw George Floyd get murdered. We all in the whole world saw him get murdered and treated like an animal by the law enforcement of this country. So as long as we have that document that states we are three-fifths of a person, we, Black folks and Indians, not taxed, the natives are in there as well, we will continue to be treated like animals. And so no 14th Amendment can strike the line that states Black folks are three-fifths of a person. So yes, there are many different acts, bills, rights, things, task force that we can align ourselves with, but those are band-aids. We need to focus on the issue, the root. We know any of us who have visited the Cape Coast Slave Castle, we heard energy does not die, it only transfers, okay? So what energy 